Thank you for the introduction. Um, I am Masaki Morisawa, based in Tokyo, as Jennifer mentioned, and I'm very honored to be uh, speaking to you here today uh, with such a great audience. I understand it is a mixture of students, faculty, and librarian at this eResources Discovery Week. So today I will talk about Gale Primary Sources, and this is a program where we digitize a lot of historical works like newspapers, books, manuscripts, and make them available digitally online. So before I begin my presentation, just to briefly introduce my company, Gale. We are an American publisher based in Michigan, USA, and we are known as a library publisher. And that means we publish many reference works like encyclopedias, directories, books that generally sit in the reference section of your and not only do we do that, we also digitize that material and make it available online. But today my focus will be on something a little bit different, which is Gale Primary Sources, where we digitize historical material and make them available online. So today I will just explain what Gale Primary Sources are. I will do a short demo on one of its representative products, which is a newspaper archive called the Times Digital Archive. And then I will introduce to you what other collections are available to HKBU. And actually, at Baptist U, you have a lot of Gale Primary Sources. So this might take a little bit of time, but I will try to make it concise as possible. And then I will do a demo of what we call the cross-search, where you can actually search most of these collections at the same time from a single platform. And if I have any time left, I will also very briefly introduce you to Gale eBooks. And um, this is not just for the sake of letting you know that, we ha that you have this. This is also related to Gale Primary Sources in that it helps you understand some of the background or the context of these very historical materials and I probably won't have time to talk about these two other products, so I'll just give you an FYI slide at the end that you have these things. Okay, so I will start out with a little quiz. You don't have to actually answer this because I understand, uh, you know, this is a Zoom session, so it might be awkward unmuting and um, talking and turning yourself off, but just think for a moment. I have six book covers on the screen at this moment. And all of these are kind of historical books. And they all have something in common. You have a title called Collection of Charts and Memoirs, Jack Harkway and his father, The Haunt of the Pirates, Queen Victoria, Other Poems, Lansbury Labors Weekly, Electrical Tables and Formulae, Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. Okay, I let you th thought, think for a moment, and I will give you the answer. The answer is all of these books contain references to Hong Kong. So this was actually kind of a, a trick question. You're not expected to answer this correctly. Nobody can, I think. But the uh, thing I wanted to show you is with Gale Primary Sources, you can find words and phrases right in the middle of a book, or right in the middle of a magazine, or right in the middle of a historical newspaper, and come right to that page with that term and word highlighted on the screen, just like this. So you might be wondering, how did you do that? I'm here to explain that to you in the following minutes. So. Gale Primary Sources is a program, a publishing program, where Gale, a publisher, has digitized many, many primary sources, historical documents, historical books from many different institutions. What we do is we visit many universities and libraries in the world that hold this kind of material. We get their permission, and then we go into the library and do scanning Sometimes we would scan the materials directly like you see in the slide, or sometimes we might use 
uh, a film technology called microfilm, where we digitize from a photograph of a book or newspaper. And this is the very important secret sauce that goes into this. We use a technology called optical character recognition, OCR. And this enables us to actually read the text from the image. That means you can actually do a search on each of those words and phrases that are printed in these historical materials, just like I, you saw in that little quiz example that I showed to you in, in the beginning. So you could do a search on a word or phrase like Hong Kong and find that phrase right in the middle of a book or right in the middle of a newspaper, just like so basically, this is the concept of the Gale primary sources. And I think, you know, it might be a little bit still fuzzy in your mind because I'm only using a little bit of screenshots. So in order to give you a better idea, I would like to do a brief demo here. And the product I have chosen to show you first is called the Times Digital Archive. This is an archive, this is a database of the London Times newspaper. And this is a newspaper that is still in print. It is still existing. And it is one of the oldest, lang oldest newspapers in the world. In fact, it, in the English language, it's the oldest continually published newspaper in the world. It was first started in 1785 in the late 18th century and still continues to this day. And it has had a tremendous influence on historical affairs, historical public opinion, especially in the English language world and Britain in particular, but throughout the world. So it's a really, really fascinating resource. And there are many, many thousands and millions of topics you can choose from, but I just chose a topic that is kind of interesting to myself personally and hopefully to you as well. So, here, I will show you how to access the Times Digital Archive. You don't have to do this right now because uh, you want to stay on Zoom, as Jennifer said, but um, you can look at this later and try it yourself after the session. So you go to the library website, you choose the Databases tab, and you can do a search on Times, and then select the Times Digital Archive. That's very simple. I will do this later after, afterwards online so you can take a look. And the topic I have chosen is the Tokyo Olympic Games. So this year, as many of you know, uh, the Summer Olympics are supposed to be held in Tokyo, although I'm not exactly sure if we're going to push through because of the you know, many things happening. But um, hopefully, we will have that. However, as I mentioned, um, the Times Digital Archive is a historical resource. And the Tokyo 2020 Olympics hasn't even started yet. So instead of the 2020 Olympics, I will use the one before, the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, as an example. So let me change to the browser here. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Let me see if I can do this correctly. Jennifer, do you see my browser? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I can go to the um, Baptist U library site. There is a tab that says databases. And you can go by alphabetically, but because Baptist has many databases, I would recommend that you do a search on times. And you will still find a few databases, but among them you would find the times digital archive. I won't click this link here because I am not a, a BU member and I might get challenged uh, by a password. So instead, I already have the uh, database already opened on my screen, I'll make it full screen. So this is what it looks like. As you can see, it's a historical newspaper and it's from 1785 to 2014. I'm going to do a very simple search on Tokyo Olympics. I'll keep that singular and just enter. 
and I get 442 results from on the, on, the, on the search Tokyo Olympic. And these are ordered from the oldest articles all the way down to the newest articles. Okay. And you might notice something curious here because I mentioned that the previous Olympics was in 1964. But here you see articles from the 1920s, the 1930s. What is this? So I'm just curious. I might open one of these articles. And it would open in another tab here. Okay. And it takes a little bit while to, uh, to load. Sorry, my um, home internet connection is sometimes a little bit stubborn. But while we look at this, we may see the citation. And I clicked on view full citation here. This is an article from 1937, August 25th, and it's titled Students Games in Paris. Now this is a rather long article. I will kind of scroll down on it. And maybe I'll just move this here, right? And here, if you're seeing my screen, you would notice that the word Tokyo Olympic is highlighted in green right in the middle of the article. But it's kind of interesting because it says the Tokyo Olympic Games in 1940 would be obligatory. That was kind of interesting. I didn't know that there was an Olympic game in 1940 because I always thought that the Tokyo Olympics was in 1964. So I did some little bit of research and found out, and here I will return to my uh, PowerPoint here. Hopefully this is working. Okay. And I won't repeat this because I already did this. Actually, I found out after doing a little reading about the Olympics that there actually was an Olympic, Olympic game planned in 1940. However, if you look back in you know 20th century history, I've, I'm sure it's very obvious that 1940 in Asia was not a very peaceful time. And many of the reasons are actually because of Japan. And the Tokyo Olympics had to be canceled because of that um, political turbulence during this time. So it's kind of, you know, a sad story of the Olympics being planned, but then having to be canceled. My personal hope is that that won't happen in 2020 again. But the interesting thing is you can make an unexpected discovery like that. I was just searching Tokyo Olympics, expecting to find material from 1964, but unexpectedly, discovered something and actually learned something from the historical resource that there was another Olympics planned in 1940. So, um, I will go again live a little bit. Excuse me. And, oops, I need to see this, I think. Okay, I hope my screen is now visible to you again. All right, um, I will do a little bit more demonstration here. Right now, I go back to the search results page and I see 442 results. And this might be a little bit too much. And I'm actually not interested in the 1940 Olympics. I'm interested in the 1964 Olympics. So I might want to filter this down and how do I do that? If you look at the right-hand side of your search results, you would see these little boxes here that change color when you kind of hover over them. These are all different filters that you can use. You can filter by publication section. And you know, these are the different sections of the newspaper, like the news section, the advertising section, and the people section, and so on and so forth. 
You can filter by document type. Do you want to look at an article? Are you looking for an obituary? So and so forth. You can further limit by date, all dates or before a certain date, on a certain date, after or between a certain date. Or you can also look at subjects, authors, or people as a subject. And finally, you can also add an additional keyword to further narrow it down. So these are really helpful tools. And because I'm interested in the 1964 Olympics, I might just narrow my dates. Instead of looking at all the dates available, I'm going to look at articles from 1964. And once I select a date, I will click. You don't have to enter the month and day if you're not um, sure about the month or day. You can just enter the year and just click on apply. And you would see that the results have changed. Um, previously, I had 400 something. Now I have only 126 and the results are much more focused. And here I can start really looking at the various articles that are really contemporary to the 1964 Olympics Games. You can also try something interesting. Still, 126 results is a lot of material to sift through. One kind of interesting way you can look at this is called the Topic Finder. The Topic Finder would look at the first top 100 results of your results list and it will kind of arrange all the different keywords and topics that are referred to in these results and turn it back to you in a very visual and interactive way. So I will just click on start the topic finder. And here you would see a kind of an interactive graph, if you will, graphic, if you will, that shows me all the different topics that are referred to within my 120 something results. And I see something like South Africa. And I'm kind of interested, what, what was um, the news about South Africa in 1964? And I might click on last chance for South Africa and further look at a different article. So now I'm looking at an article from 1964 that is probably referring to the Tokyo Olympics Games of 1964. So far with me, okay. Now, when you're looking at an article like this, you would also notice that you have some tools around here, and they're usually clustered at the top. These are very useful tools, so I'll explain them one, to, one by one to you. Uh, the first tool is the citation tool. So, say you are uh, writing a paper on history and you want your topic is the Tokyo Olympics and you want to refer to this article in your paper but you know when you refer to an article in a paper you have to cite it in a certain format this tool when you click on it will automatically create a citation in the MLA format which is the most common format used in the humanities or the APA format or the Chicago format. Or if you have access to one of these tools like RefWorks, EasyBib, or Noodle tools, or if you don't, you can also export it as an RIS format. Um, and I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, Baptist U has access to a tool called Mendeley. Am I correct? Okay, I think, I think uh, that was the case. In that case, you can actually download the citation in an RIS format and import it into Mendeley as well, if you know how to use that tool. If not, I would just recommend that you use one of these two citation formats and you can just copy and paste this into your paper and your citation will be done. You can also send this article to places. You can either send it to a Google Drive or OneDrive or you also have the option to send this in email. But just one thing is when you send it to email, sorry, I have a chat. Thank uh, you. Hello. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, I think 20 seconds ago, the sound was a little really. 
Oh, really? I'm sorry. So uh, maybe I should repeat the citation tool then? Okay. Um, um, I, I was told that the sound uh, just went away for 20, 20 seconds or so. So instead, I will just repeat the citation tool. So once you get to the article, you see these little tools in the top. And one of the tools is called the citation tool where you can generate a citation, which you can easily copy and paste into a paper. Or if you have access to one of these tools, you can also export the citation into that tool using these buttons. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can send this article. You can send it to your Google Drive, or if you have a Microsoft OneDrive, or you can email the article. Now, when you want to send this to a Google Drive, you just click on Google Drive, and it will tell you, do you want, to, do you want this article to be sent as an image, like a PDF, or do you want to look at the text behind the article? So you can choose either options. But before I do that, I might want to warn you that the text is not a perfect text because we use this technology called optical character recognition. And that's like a computer reading this image and converting it into text. So it's fairly accurate most of the time but it doesn't get everything accurate. You can see some glitches here and there, even looking at this text. So just be uh, aware that this text might not be a perfect transcription of the image, but it's a good place to start. And you can actually view this text by clicking on this uh, tick box here or turn it off. So when you send to your Google Drive, you'll be told, do you want the image or do you want the text? And in this case, I might want the image. So I just click on send. And the document will be sent to my Google Drive. And when I open my Google Drive, this is my Google Drive, you would notice that a new a folder would have been created called the Times Digital Archive. And in it, you can see the exact same article in PDF format, except it will be the entire page, not just that um, article, but you can see the article right here. Okay. So that's the send to function. One note is um, when you choose email, it won't change, it won't send you the document image itself. It will only send you a link to the document. This is because of bandwidth restrictions. So uh, just be aware that the email tool is a little bit different from the other two. Or you can just download this article in the same way to your local computer or print it out if you have access to a printer. Or if you just want the link, a stable URL to this article, you can click on get link and it will generate a stable URL which you can then copy and paste. Now this is very important because some people Sometimes, you know, you just want to choose the URL that is showing in the browser here. And most of the time the URL works here, but it's usually better, it's a better idea to click on the get link tool. So you get a stable URL, uh, a permanent URL to this particular article itself. So these tools are very helpful when you're using this material. You can also zoom in and zoom out or fit to width, fit to height, and so and so forth. And if it's a multi-page article, you can also go move between pages as well. Okay. You can also go to the table of contents. And this will be the table of contents for this entire newspaper issue. So this was from 1964, June 27th. So here you can see the entire Times newspaper uh, for this date. And you can kind of browse through all of the pages if you want and many different articles that are covered within uh, this newspaper issue. Okay, so this is basically how you use the Times Digital Archive. Now here I will move on back to my slides. 
All right. I hope you're, you're seeing my slides again here. And here are some things that are important when you're dealing with historical resources like primary sources. The great thing about primary sources is, as I hope I have demonstrated to you, is you can re-experience history as it was actually unfolding. So these are really raw records of history, fingerprints of history itself. So the people who were writing these newspaper articles were not aware what was going to happen next. They were just writing and living their time. So it's really, really exciting to re-experience history as it was happening. You can also feel the contemporary mood, the vocabulary, the tone, and you know the values that are reflected in the writing of the historical material. And as I demonstrated, you can make unexpected discoveries by doing full text searches. You can search for any word or phrase that comes into your mind and probably find something that is interesting that you didn't really expect to see because there's so much material from history. And if you look at multiple articles over a period of time, you can even trace how interpretations of a certain event changed over time, even in a single newspaper archive, like the Times Digital Archive. So these are the great things about using primary sources. There are also some things you need to be careful about. So, Primary does not always mean correct. You know, newspapers don't always tell the truth. We know that. And even when they think they are telling the truth, they could turn out to be mistaken or events can change. For example, I show you here an article from the Times that says, North Korea to compete in Tokyo after all. This is not true because well, at this time, at, this, uh, at the date of this particular newspaper article, yes, North Korea was planning to compete in the Tokyo Olympics, but later on, they reversed. And they ultimately, they didn't participate in Tokyo Olympics. So you can't look at an old newspaper and you know, judge what happened solely looking at that. You have to look at other sources to confirm what you find or um, test the knowledge that you found. So primary does not always mean correct. You need to know the historical context of things. So you might need to know the political context of why North Korea decided to um, not participate in the Tokyo Olympics, for example. One great um, point I want to make is this is very different from, say, doing a Google search online you need to be careful to use search terms that would have, you, would have been used in the source material. So I cite here as a bad example, World War I. If you want to do a search on the Times Digital Archive, for example, and look for material that was published during World War I, you can't really use the term World War I. And I hope you can understand why, because World War I was not called World War I when it was actually happening. That's pretty obvious when you think about it, because it only became World War I after World War II happened. So they didn't call these events World War I when it was happening. Maybe they called it the Great War, but even that phrase was used only after the war really escalated into a really great scale. So you really have to be careful what search terms do you want to use. Sometimes words like um, Chinese names in particular, do you want to do the pinyin um, spelling like Mao Zedong or should you use the Wade Giles spelling Mao Zedong as they used to spell his name in the Western world? Or you might want to be careful about place names that have cha changed, you know, uh, Germany used to be East Germany and West Germany during a certain period. Maybe it was the Holy Roman Empire before that. So you really need to know your history and find the right search term when you're looking, to, looking for something like this. And the last point is 
Full text search is great, but it is not 100% accurate. As I mentioned in the beginning, we use a special technology called OCR, which is basically a computer reading an image. And computers can make, make mistakes, especially if the material is centuries old. So sometimes you would find a text that is read mistakenly by the OCR computer. So that is another thing you should um, take into uh, consideration when you're using these primary source, source material digitally. So I want, want to show you another uh, really cool tool, which is called the Term Frequency Tool. You don't have to, again, you don't have to follow me here. You can do this later on your own. But I will just do this exercise myself with my browser. So I go back to the Times Digital Archive. I hope you're seeing this again. And instead, I just go back to the home page. And when I go down and scroll down, I would see this tool that says term frequency. Explore the coverage of your search terms graphed over time. So I click on that tool. And here I have this little graph builder and you see the number of years over here. So I might again, instead of Tokyo Olympics, I'm interested in Olympics itself. I enter Olympics and I get this funny zigzag graph. Of course, there are very few references in the 19th century. So I may want to really zoom into this period. I can do that by dragging my mouse and letting go. And I like, I, this is my particular favorite because you can see the obvious here. If you look carefully at the graph, you would notice that, you know, the graph goes up every four years. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you know. And if you're interested in a particular year, you can just click on that dot. And you can look at the results for the 2004 uh, Olympics here. And you can also change the sorting by relevance. So I can see the articles that are most related to the Olympics. And this is from the London Olympics, of course. No, sorry, is this from the London Olympics? My memory kind of, but anyway, you can see from that particular year. So that's another tool that I wanted to show to you uh, with the uh, Gale primary sources. So, sorry I go back and forth between uh, internet and PowerPoint, but that's just my style here. Okay. Now, things to note with the term frequency tool. This graph shows the number of articles or the number of hits results uh, from for each year. It doesn't show the number of words in the graph. So one dot, one hit can, you know, contain maybe two or four references to the word Olympics, but that fact will not be reflected in the graph itself. Only one hit, one article will be one hit. And some years may simply have more articles than others, you know, so you can do a search on one term and see a peak in say 1985 and you say, wow, this topic was really popular in 1985 until you do uh, graphs with many other words and you find that, hey, 1985 seems to have more material than all the other years all the time. So when you're using this graph, although I didn't do it right now because I, that was a very simple demo, it's always good to compare two similar or related terms rather than just one term. And when you go back to that tool, it's very easy to use. You can try two or three or four or five or many, as many related terms as you want to and compare those little graphs on the screen. So I think that will be a very interesting exercise you can do later when you access the tool. So um, here I would like to show you very briefly what other Gale primary sources are available to your university and you have a lot so I may have to rush through, rush through these slides a little bit 
but I will make this PowerPoint available to the library and hopefully they, will, um, they can make it available to you as well if you want to examine it later in more detail. Um, these are the Gale primary sources currently available to HKBU. And I kind of categorized them into three different clusters. Uh, sorry, four different clusters. The first one is what I call the newspaper clusters. Um, so this is very obvious. These are newspaper archives, beginning with the Times Digital Archive that I just showed you. You have many other newspapers too. And the second one is called the periodicals cluster. And here you have various magazines, um, periodicals, and other things that are also um, published regularly, but are not newspapers exactly. And these are the more complex collections that are mostly related to political history. And these are rather high level stuff uh, like government documents or correspondence between uh, people, private correspondence and things like that. And last but not least, uh, HKBU has a very strong uh, holding on gender history. So we, they have two uh, very big um, collections on sexuality and gender and women's studies as well. And one little thing, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I am about to demonstrate the cross search function of Gale Primary Sources, we can, where you can cross search almost everything together. There is one little exception that you have to note, the National Geographic uh, Virtual Library. This is not available in your cross search. So, uh, if you want to use the National Geographic Virtual Library, you have to go to this resource individually. Was there a chat? Sorry. Oh, that's, oh Jennifer. That's me. That's me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, the newspapers, I'll just go through this very quickly. You just, I just already introduced you the Times Digital Archive. The Times is actually published from Monday to Saturday, and it has a sister publication called the Sunday Times. Actually, it was originally unrelated to the Times. And because it's a weekly publication, the emphasis is not so much on the news, but more on investigative reporting and culture, like uh, theater reviews and book reviews. You also have access to the International Herald Tribune, which is a very famous global newspaper based in Paris, but an English language newspaper. And it was read by people all over the world. So typically this newspaper tends to have more coverage about Asia than the other newspapers. And you also have the Illustrated London News, which is a great, great newspaper because it contains lots of illustration, you know, as the name uh, really implies, and photographs later in and then you also have a huge collection of British newspapers from the British Library, mainly from the 19th century. Periodicals. I believe most of you will be familiar with The Economist, and it's like a magazine. They actually call themselves a newspaper, but I, I think they are a magazine. It's a weekly magazine for business people, and they talk mainly about economic aspects of news. Punch is another really fun magazine. This is a humor magazine. It's a satirical magazine that contains also a lot of cartoons and illustrations. Picture Post is a photo, photojournalistic magazine. Um, if you know Life magazine in the US, which is a very famous photojournalism magazine from the 20th century, Picture Post was sort of its counterpart, counterpart in the UK. It was very short-lived, contains a lot of photographs. The Times Literary Supplement, or TLS as they call it, is a literary review. And China and the Modern World Part One is a collection of historical English language periodicals from the 19th century to the early 20th century about or published in or about China. And National Geographic, I think, is very, very clear. But this one, as I mentioned, does not work in the cross search. Then you have the political and gender history stuff. I will go, this, uh, go through this fairly quickly. 19th century collections online. Um, 
in HKBU's case, you can uh, you have the Asia module of this collection, which contains a lot of diplomatic reports from the 19th century in Asia, China and the Modern World Part Four. This is really relevant to your uh, territory here. It's uh, the British Colonial Office papers on Hong Kong. So these are really um, some political uh, communications between the governor in Hong Kong and the people in the UK. You also have a huge collection of US government documents, declassified documents, mainly from the 20th century. Archives Unbound, um, this is a very customizable collection. In your university, you have 13 collections, mainly related to Asia. And last but not least, you have two gender-related archives. One is Archives of Sexuality and Gender, and the focus here will be on LGBTQ movements. And the last one, Women's Studies Archive, looks at women's movements, feminism, from the 19th and 20th uh, centuries, mainly. So that was a lot of information to digest. I don't expect you to remember all of this, but later when you look, look back at these slides, hopefully you will find something interesting. So here I would like to show you how you can start doing a cross search. I will again, sorry, return to my screen and I think, oops, where did my zoom control go? I keep making this mistake, sorry. All right, I hope you see my screen here again. Okay, so I'm going back to the Times Digital Archive and I will do the same search. Except after doing my search on the Times Digital Archive, now that I know that there are many other Gale primary sources in the university, I'm curious what kind of material can I find in those resources? If you scroll down just a little bit, you would find this icon that says broaden your search. And this is actually a very new feature that I'm very, very fond of. You can start your search in any of these archives, but if you want to expand and cross search everything that is available to you, you could just do that by clicking on Gale Primary Sources here. And boom. You might recall that in the Times search results, I had 442 results, but now a new tab appears with the same search term, except now I have 854 results. And these are just the newspapers and periodicals. But you also see things like monographs. That's a kind of a fancy word for book. You can just think this is books. And manuscripts, these are mainly political documents. Most of them are handwritten or typewritten. So I can look at the newspapers and periodicals and I notice that there are other things from, not just from the Times. And maybe I'm curious, I want to look at something else. So I look at the, uh, the Illustrated London News. I would just want to filter by a particular database. I can do that. And because the Illustrated London News is an illustrated newspaper. You can see big photographs like this one. And actually the Tokyo Olympics in 1964 was the first Olympic Games to be broadcast worldwide using satellite technology. So that was a really big thing back then. So you see the rocket launching the satellite. I think this was a few years before the actual Olympic Games and I think it was in 1960. Oh, it was the same year, sorry. So this is the kind of thing that you could do with the Gale Primary Sources cross search. And you can do expand your search into many different areas. And the tools are pretty much the same, except uh, one thing you would notice is it's not just limited to newspapers and periodicals. You can also th see things like books. And in this case, you can also see, also see some political documents here and manuscripts as well. So these things will be shown in different tabs or these little buttons here, which you can switch between. Apart from that, most of the features are pretty much the same. So I shall return to my PowerPoint and I am um, conscious of the time. 
So I will just give you this notes about the cross search. The, the main difference between using a single database and using the cross search is with a cross search, you would see more material and more types of material. So as you saw in my screen just now, you don't just see newspapers and periodicals, you would see things like monographs, books, and manuscripts. And when you look at each of these sections, initially, they would only show you the top three results for each content type. So you would only see the top three monographs, the top three manuscripts, the top three newspaper and periodical articles, but you can always click on those menus and expand it to the full list. That's how this interface works. And one thing to note is that newspapers and periodicals usually get more hits than books or manuscripts because first of all, they, newspapers tend to cover a lot of different topics. So you can search for anything and probably get a hit from one of the newspapers. And the other thing is with newspapers and periodicals, as you may have noticed, instead of showing you the entire newspaper page, we split those newspapers into individual articles and each article is a hit. So that's another reason you would see more results from newspapers and periodicals than from the other content types. So that's a little tip that you should keep in mind uh, when you're doing a cross search. So I would just want to give you another tip about content. Uh, this is an interesting article that I found from the Times Digital Archive uh, when I was doing some um, research on the Tokyo Olympics. This was from 1962, so this was two years before the Olympic Games. And it says, Japanese swimmers receive apology. And I was just wondering, what, what kind of apology? What is the context of this apology? And it was apparently happened in South Africa where the South African Amateur Swimming Union apologized to the Japanese swimming management and the team because they did not allow Japanese swimmers to use the public swimming pool. Now this article might not make sense to you unless you knew a little bit of history. And of course, I believe many of you already know this, that South Africa was a country that until fairly recently had this racial segregation policy called the apartheid. And so people who were not white, including Japanese people, Chinese, and, and many of those people were not allowed to swim in the same swimming pools as white people in South Africa. But because this was right before the Tokyo Olympics, they realized, uh -uh, this is not very good diplomacy. So they decided to apologize. But my point is, in order to understand historical periodicals, historical materials, you really, really need to do a little bit of background study. You don't have to, but the more things you know about the time period you are searching for, the better. Okay, so context is everything. That's my most important tip for the day uh, that I leave you, leave you with. So I think I'm only five, I only have five minutes left. So I'll just, you know, um, go quickly through this part. And um, this, this is just, you know, showing you that you can learn more about each resource by clicking on these menus called about research tools and collections. And some of these products, like for example, archives of sexuality and gender are more complex than the Times Digital Archives in that they consist of multiple collections. So it might be really important when you use these art um, products to actually look at the individual collections. But this is more for an, uh, an advanced audience, I guess. So I will just skip this part very quickly. And I was going to talk to you about Gale eBooks, but maybe I should probably stop here and just wrap it up here. So. Gale primary sources, historical resources in digital format, products like newspapers, monographs from a historical period are available. And we contain a mix, our resources contain a mix of multiple content. types. Some of the products, as I really briefly showed to you a few seconds ago, 
are comprised of multiple collections. Some of the products are more complex than the others. And most of the products, except for the National Geographic in your case, can be cross-searched. So that's a really great tool. And when you're searching, you can search using full text searching enabled by OCR, optical character recognition. You can also do some visual search methods. I showed to you the term frequency tool, that little line graph thing, and the topic finder, the, color, the colorful graphic search results that can kind of help you to find and identify uh, little topics or um, trends that you might have missed when you're just looking at a linear search result. And I show to you the importance of using period search terms, historical search terms. Think historically. Try to use the vocabulary that might have been used during the period you are searching for. And another important, um, uh, another little um, tip I can give you is when you look at your first search results, you often find those period search terms when you're ex actually examining the material you find, as you're reading the articles, you might find, oh, I can use this word as well and search it, search on it as well. So it's not um, important to get it right the first time. You just search for something, read the material, and as you kind of repeat that process, you'll probably find new keywords that you can use and want to try out. Lastly, the most important part, it really helps to know the historical context of the materials. And we have a lot of contextual material in the product themselves, although I, I didn't have the time to show it to you today. You can click on the about links or the research tools links or the collection descriptions in some of the products and read those essays that um, our, our editors and advisors have written to understand better about each product. And I didn't have time to demonstrate this to you as well, but we also have a database called Gale eBooks which is a collection of reference works. That may also help. So, sorry, I'm kind of really running out of time, but thank you very much. And I think I should hand it over back to Jennifer. Oh, thank you so much, Masaki. It's really comprehensive. Um, you. you shared a lot. And that's because uh, we do have lots of access to your resources. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I, I just, I, I copied paste the link of uh, um, the Gale resources uh, to the chat room uh, so that everyone, if you can uh, click on the link and then that links you to the, uh, our entire collection of Gale resources. Uh, and mm -hmm. also as Masaki mentioned, uh, you can go to our database tab and then uh, search uh, using the A to Z list or you can type in a certain keywords like times or gender uh, or um, other terms uh, related to the uh, particular history archive that you want to focus on. Yes, really great uh, uh, presentation. Thank you, Masaki. Um, and then we have two minutes left. So really, uh, still, if you, want, if you have any questions, please just uh, add it over the chat box, or you can raise your hand using the uh, blue icon uh, down at the participant list. So uh, take your time. Uh, maybe uh, you need to type uh, a little bit quickly uh, to let us know if you have any burning questions. Um, and then I have, well, I have one question, and then Wayne just let me know that uh, she has another question. So hopefully uh, you can address it uh, um, to the students. Uh, the first mm -hmm. question I have is about uh, image indexing. So I wonder yes. for the uh, pictures in the uh, newspapers, will you mm -hmm. index it? Um, and then Wayne's question is related to uh, big data mining of your collection. Like mm -hmm. I know there are topic finders, there are term frequencies, but mm -hmm. uh, we want to know whether you have certain uh, policy about us downloading the text and then further mm -hmm. using additional tool to analyze the data. So two questions for you. Okay, uh, those are great questions. And uh, for the first question about image indexing, we do index our images to an extent. So within each book or monographs, uh, you have the, we have the, you, if you go to advanced search in one of our products, you can actually search for particular types of images or actually for books containing particular types of images 
like you can search for a book containing a photograph, for example. And with our newspapers, we also index our images separately. So you can search for articles that are illustrated, uh, articles with illustrations or photographs. Uh, about your second question about textual data mining, yes, we do allow textual data mining. Um, and I can later send to you the terms and conditions about that. Um, and I believe that document has already been um, shared with the library from our sales um, people, but I can resend it to you okay. about the nitty gritty details about those uh, policies. That's great to know. Um, mm -hmm. And then as you have already sort of give us the permission uh, about this slide, uh, we really oh, yes. uh, think it will be very useful to refer to later on since there are so many things to note, uh, textualization and then also like term frequency, like you probably will find newspapers more often than uh, monographs. That's also very useful things to pay mm -hmm. attention when you do primary research, uh, uh, like you need to think as if you are in that historical event rather than yes. 2020. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and then as everyone can see right now, I'm just sharing the last slide about the feedback survey. So uh, this is the last thing I want everyone to do is to just use one, maybe 30 seconds to fill in a feed, uh, very quick feedback uh, to our session today. Uh, the link is already posted in the chat box. And then for today's session, this session, uh, we use the session code 006. So please everyone uh, click on the link and then let us know your feedback.